According to 2022 IMF GDP estimates, Taiwan is the 21st largest economy in the world. Today, we will explore how Taiwan's economy has boosted the country's profile in academia and other fields, despite increasing pressure from China to silence Taiwan's voice on the world stage. Hi, and welcome to Taiwan Talks, covering the latest global news analysis from a Taiwan perspective. I'm Annie Cole. I'm Brath Wang. Joining us in the studio for the discussion is Chun Yi Lee, Social Sciences Associate Professor at the University of Nottingham School of Politics and International Relations. She is also the director of the Taiwan Studies Program at the university, and Leonard Chow, adjunct professor at National Tsinghua University and former Taiwan ambassador to the Kingdom of Eswatini, an expert in Taiwan's international relations. Welcome, Professor Lee, and it's really good to have you back, Ambassador. Thank you. I also spoke earlier to Ai Wen Chu, the first Asian American female New York State Senator elect. Chu was born and raised in Taiwan before moving to the U.S. to attend graduate school. Taiwan's Ministry of Education signed a memorandum of cooperation with the University of Oxford at the end of November. On the same day, the university launched the Taiwan Studies Program with a focus on Taiwan's success in economic development. Our first question goes to you, Professor. Um, as the director of the Taiwan Studies Program at the University of Nottingham, you've also launched um, the online magazine of the program, Taiwan Insights. Can you talk a bit about how that has elevated Taiwan's status in the international academic arena? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I think, um, well, um, we have this uh, Taiwan Insight. It's an online magazine, and actually it's an academic blog. And Taiwan Insight was established in uh, September 2017. Mm. The initiative for me to establish such an academic blog focus on Taiwan, but not just on Taiwan, it's everything related to Taiwan, is to create sort of a platform for people uh, not only in academics, but also who are interested in Taiwan to read about Taiwan and to contribute to their um, observations about Taiwan. And to be honest, at the very beginning, Taiwan Insight was very um, small. I should say that the viewers and contributions was rather shy in numbers. But with the time growing, that uh, the Taiwan Insight's uh, contribution can be said, we, we will say that we can publish daily. And our followers are more than um, 6,000 per day in that sense. Is that in the UK or also outside? Also outside. Actually, our biggest reader groups is in the States. Mm. And also in Taiwan and also in Japan. So that's the main reason I established Taiwan Insight as an online blog, because it reached out to global audience. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the benefit in a sense of the blog, which is easy to read and also easy to contribute to. The length of the uh, blog piece is about 1,000 to 1,500 words. Right. Um, so it's very easy for a reader and also for a contributor. And I think in that sense, we sort of connected to beyond academic mm -hmm. um, contributors and readers. I would say, with the, um, because topic you, the question you ask is about economic growth, right? right yeah. Connection with. But actually, to be honest with you, I think um, of late, the Taiwan's economic growth is not let the only main focus. In our magazine, actually, we realize there are various other issues attract readers and contributors' interests. What resonates with the readers the most outside from, as you mentioned, other than economic issues? LGBTQ issue, mm -hmm. COVID pandemics control, Right. How Taiwanese uh, governments responded to the COVID. Um, what else? Transitional justice, yeah, and uh, social movements. All around soft power. All Taiwan around soft community. power, yes. And in a sense, I learned from my own <laughs> magazine, in a sense, because I'm trained as a political economist. So, of course, I focus on the politics and economy. And I realized that the uh, audience, or the writers, and also the interested readers, they know more than just Have you seen anything politics. substantial that's come out of this, like say, with the readers, them going into something more concrete, say, uh, new agreements or some kind of cooperation with other countries? Actually, our readers do not know cooperation, this kind of a very specific term, but they know what happens in terms of the, um, the LGBTQ movements mm -hmm. and in terms of the controversial pork issue. Right. Yeah. So. 
it is again what I wanted to say is we wanted to present Taiwan to the public, mm -hmm. not only the elite. Of course, elites is important, which we can discuss later. Right. But how do we bring Taiwan out from just the academic and also elite circle? I think this is the block what we are doing. And so far, I would say I've seen it as a growing slowly, but I would say happily in that sense, because it's also music, theater, mm -hmm. the whole culture, culture, the whole, right. yeah, Taiwan is interesting, not just we think it's interesting. Exactly. It is interesting yeah. because of various varieties of the facades and everything. And I think um, following our magazine, that can be seen that it's not we to ask them to write, they would contribute to ourselves. Right. Yeah. So I, I think Professor really pointed out a very important point, and that is through the soft power, we're not just seeing pop culture, we're also seeing economically and also politically, we're bringing out everything about Taiwan through media, magazine, and also as what Rath mentioned earlier, because right now University of Oxford, they're also um, participating, collaborating with Taiwan with the Taiwan Studies Program. So with all these soft power, media-wise, academically-wise, I would like to switch to the ambassador yeah. from a <clears throat> diplomatic perspective point of view. How is this going to raise the awareness and visibility of Taiwan in general? All right. Uh, you, uh, you can, it's funny. You, should, you keep mentioning about the, the magic the word, the, uh, the soft power. Right. Okay. Coincidentally, the soft power, the, this term was coined mm -hmm. by my professor, one of my professors really? at Harvard University. Okay. You know, Joseph Nye. Joseph Nye, uh, right. Yeah. You, yes. uh, you know, I took his course and he, he gave me a very uh, generous, you know, grading result. Yes. So I, I appreciate his... Uh, but I, 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 I'm proud of him, you know, in, in coining, inventing this, uh, this new term. South Power has been very popular, but wi widely known. Right. Uh, but particularly, that can apply perfectly to Taiwan story. Mm -hmm. But speaking of this uh, project between our two ministries, I think that's a very fascinating and also a meaningful one. And uh, other than the UK, you know, uh, what the professor just mentioned about the, the beautiful story. And I used to be uh, posted in uh, Washington, D.C., as okay. you might be aware of that. Mm -hmm. So take my posting, for example, and I was, uh, uh, you know, I witnessed what the academic you know, exchanges can help Taiwan uh, in, in Washington area, Maryland, you know, Maryland University and, and the University of Virginia, all the neighboring, you know, the, uh, the, the American uh, state. So I witnessed and also I experienced, I mean, I experienced a lot of you know, the, uh, the, uh, the real, okay, activities mm -hmm. for those uh, academic institutions in Washington area. Mm -hmm. For example, you know, I, I was invited to give speech in certain universities such as University of Maryland mm -hmm. and also Georgetown okay. and George Washington uh -huh. and American U. And other than these universities, we also have uh, quite a few very w well known and very outstanding think tanks in Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. such as, you know, Heritage Foundation, okay, CSI, as you know very well. So those uh, institutions, and, uh, and I, we have been working with each other very, very uh, closely and extensively. Because of my job then, I used to be in charge of the political session, mm -hmm. dealing with um, American administration, executive okay. branch, mm -hmm. and also I was uh, at another time in charge of the congressional liaison office. Yes. So that gave me a chance to, uh, to appear and to be exposed to the Capitol Hill people. Mm -hmm. So those senators, friends of mine, and congressmen or congresswomen, including Nancy Pelosi, Oh, okay. For example, to them a few. They uh, asked me for certain information about Taiwan's development mm -hmm. in terms of a cultural one, not only a political, uh, economic and cultural and social uh, diversities. So I would, I would consult those think tanks, universities mm -hmm. for some information. So they helped me a lot. Mm -hmm. So we've been working with each other, quite a, quite a complementary nature between, the, between them and myself. So, and I was also very happy to, uh, to uh, to deliver certain speeches about the, uh, the Taiwan's development. Mm -hmm. And also, not only for the, uh, the political, diplomatic, you know, mm -hmm. sensitive area, but also some other very soft power part of Taiwan's development. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think I found that very, very uh, you know, stimulating and very encouraging and very enlightening. Mm -hmm. So I enjoy doing that. So I, I like to say in the, in the word that I'm, I'm seeing, I, I highly recommend and highly you know, second this, this great idea we should keep it going on. Mm -hmm. But do you feel that these have actually increased? Given yes, it has. It has. You know, for example, okay, uh, one, uh, one true anecdote. You know, I was invited to uh, University of Maryland 
for one of the presidential elections of Taiwan because the other U of M, Maryland University's faculty and students, they are very concerned about what will happen in the upcoming Taiwan's presidential election. Exactly. So I try to be a, you know, humorous. Uh, the audience, you know, it's a, it's a packed house. They asked me, who's going to be the winner of the coming election? I said, do you know the winner? I said, yes, I do. You sure? <laughs> how much? How proper? I said, yep, 100%. I know who the winner is. I said, who? The Taiwanese people. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I brought down the house. But it's kind of a, that's one of the examples. Right. I like to, uh, I like, because that gave me a chance to be exposed to some academic. Exactly. So that's how. That's why, one of the reasons why I'm, I'm teaching. Right. It's good to use humor to break the ice. Right. Yeah. Right. And, and Ambassador actually mentioned one of the soft, soft powers that he really utilizes through his speeches at different universities in That's the right. U.S., correct, yeah. as a diplomat yourself. Yeah. So I wanted to ask Professor a little bit, um, because you're also teaching, you're a professor, yeah. so we were just also wondering, right now there are a lot of collaborations between U.K. and Taiwan academically. But what about other countries aside from U.K.? Do you see any kind of these trends going on? And are, is Taiwan really opening their door through the educational sector as a channel? Absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. It's not just about in the UK, actually it's global. USA, as Ambassador just mentioned, actually engaged academic as I think the big, the first and the foremost right. of the resources actually go to the USA universities. I think that is geopolitical concern that for sure that is the case. But my observation as when I was a student, I didn't see Taiwan study as a thing, I could say. But through all these past years, and I, I really see the growing of the Taiwan studies, not only in the USA and the UK, but European-wise. So um, I'm a board member of European Association of Taiwan Studies that includes all the European, most of the European countries, Germany, France, Italy, uh, and also um, not, we not yet have Portugal, but we probably would have. Um, and there are really an uh, immense uh, number of the countries are interested in, especially uh, Lithuania, mm -hmm. if you, and Slovenia, those countries, they are really eager to get more in touch with the Taiwan study, the academics. Especially with their, you know, new um, trade office here in Taiwan. I think that actually is pushed also by the academic. So but I, I think the main question is, what has been behind the reason for this increase? Do you believe it's because of, say, cross strait or do you believe it's because of Taiwan's economic power or democracy? I mm. think it's a combination in many ways. I, I wouldn't say that it's uh, Taiwan's thing. With all due respect, I don't think that would be single-handed to push and that would happen. Mm -hmm. So this is coming back to the push and demand situation. If the market, if we take academic students as the market, which the UK always say that we're serving for our students, it's quite commercialized. The interest from the students on Taiwan is increased. Mm -hmm. Why? Because as in the latest years, like since 2018, the rivalry of China and USA, and then later on gets more uh, into the attention of the 2019, the Hong Kong national security law and the Uyghur, um, the human rights abuse. Uh, in many ways that uh, connect Taiwan to the students. And even further now, we're seeing the uh, Russia invasion to Ukraine. So is and it fair to say the largest think, push is actually from China? Yeah, it's from China, mm -hmm. but then it gets out Taiwan in more attention, if you like. And at the same time, Taiwan also realized that our, our government and also academic, of course, seeing that this is actually a golden window for us to push mm -hmm. the Taiwan studies globally. To be honest, that in, in the last 10 years ago, people probably would confuse Taiwan with Thailand. I don't think now it's the case uh, because Taiwan gets such attention mm -hmm. with or without, if we, we, we wouldn't say it's all because of China, but that is a really a bigger push, right. how bad China is and present people to think like, oh, actually, this is a great country, a great democracy mm -hmm. to understand. So remember, again, I'm talking about the public. I'm talking about students, not the learned elites. Mm -hmm. So how would they be attracted to understand Taiwan? That's because 
the, you know, the, the media report and also the international dynamics mm -hmm. make Taiwan really get more interesting. Right. And especially Taiwan being caught in the two superpowers, U.S. and China, that we just talked about earlier, I think it's also a very important time for us to really think about the key industries that we can really promote ourselves through these soft power channels, right? We're talking about semiconductors. We're talking about chip manufacturing. What is the key, the main key drive force of these industries um, that do we see potential in Taiwan, Ambassador? Well, I think the, uh, the, uh, the soft power per se mm -hmm. is not limited to the culture, uh, to some other, you know, academic or you know, the, uh, the, the social aspect. Uh, given my, my life and work in, in Eswatini, you know, an African you know, diplomatic ally, I know, the, you know the, the nature of my job in Africa is different, extremely different from that of in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. In Washington, you have to deal with a bunch of American politicians, and them, you know, American uh, policy or you know, makers or uh, you know, uh, the lobbyists. But in, the, in Africa, I would like to emphasize that in addition to the, the, the industry in the leading edge, okay, such as semiconductor or some of the, uh, the manufacturing industry technology, we know that Taiwan is, is known for those uh, technology you know, expertise. But I'd like to emphasize that two other points which have been ignored so far. That is one, agricultural right. expertise. Mm -hmm. And secondly, the medical service, medical service. And these two particular aspects happen to be in need of, okay, I think that will apply to the uh, African people's you know, mind very much. The, the people in, in Eswatini, they are in need of some of the agricultural and medical help. And I found that, so I, uh, I, can, I can briefly tell uh, what I did and how I did it in, in Africa, in Eswatini. Mm -hmm. I promoted, I enlarged mm -hmm. the, uh, the, the scope, the size of our agricultural and technical mission in Eswatini. Mm -hmm. That was very popular because the African people, they are in need of some agriculture and, uh, and other, you know, the, uh, the fruits and, the, and, you know, some botanic. Agriculture also has certain technology involved. Okay, not only limited to some of the, uh, the, you know, the ITC, but also agriculture and medical service. In Eswatini, they are con they're concerned about the life and death, the health. I can tell that is some other disease, a very, very uh, widespread. And uh, even the king, the ruler of the monarchy, he expressed his uh, profound concern about the, his people's life and death, well-being. So I established, I was, I was really proud of that. I established for the first time in our history, the medical mission, mm -hmm. Taiwan medical mission in Aswatini. Mm -hmm. So this kind of a, uh, the agricultural team enlarged and medical you know, a center, medical, medical mission established that held my job and also that, that, the, the, the medical history for, for the Swazi people. The king told me that. He said, well, the, you have just saved our people's life. And also, the, you were need of food. Right. Uh, that you, you are well fed. That we are well fed because of your help. And that's what I keep doing very, very uh, actively and very effectively, that the so-called grassroots, grassroots diplomacy. Right. Grassroots diplomacy that, that works for uh, African people. Just like, the, you know, because for diplomatic work, you it can hardly apply kind of universal shape, universal pattern to all the countries involved. Mm -hmm. For Americans, for a political center in Washington, D.C., or for some African culture, for some European cultural city, or some historical city, you have to, it varies from city to city. Right. It varies from country to country, and varies from culture to culture. You have to, you know, comply mm -hmm. to a different nature, different Adapt to different need. environment right. as well. Yep. That's the nature, that's the beauty of diplomatic work. It's intriguing how you've been at the front of this, and you know, in front of the king and Eswatini and building all of this from Taiwan and yeah. expanding Taiwan's international presence. And we just talked about how increasing academic exchanges and Taiwan research programs around the world are helping to expand the country's international space. Coming up next, we'll discuss what that soft power actually is and how Taiwan is working with various countries around the world in its critical role in global development. Welcome back to the show. We will now talk about what Taiwan's soft power actually is and the country's significance to global peace and development. So I wanted to go back to Professor for a little bit because Ambassador Chow actually talked a little bit more about the key industries in Taiwan in addition to semiconductors or technology. Um, medical service and agriculture is indeed very important. So being overseas and teaching overseas students for so long, how do you perceive this? 
Actually, in fact, that uh, semiconductor now is really very hot topics for uh, all my students, colleagues, and think tanks in the UK. And that's the main reason for me actually spending my sabbatical in Taiwan and doing interviews and field works about the strength of Taiwan semiconductor. Um, the interesting part of the semiconductor that is the um, its effect on everyday life, everyone everyday life. So people usually uh, compare uh, what's the impact or consequence of the Ukraine, Russia, Ukraine war that result European countries, for instance, especially the country where I, I am in the UK, the heating and electricity is so high, the price. Mm -hmm. And then we simulate what if what happened, China invaded Taiwan, that's, that's impact the disruption of the semiconductor supply chain. Mm -hmm. What happened? your car can't really start because everything is powered by that chip and uh, your microwave even can't really start because microwave also has chip not to mention your mobile and computers so among all the um, important issue ambassador just mentioned about agricultural medical help um, I would say because of the circumstances that currently semiconductor and the geopolitical tension actually attract all countries attention because once more this is not just about Taiwan right. this is global exactly and it's the mm -hmm. supply chain so it's Taiwan Japan South Korea uh, USA and European countries are worried because European countries does do not have the power or capacity and, and to build right and yeah. to add on that Professor Ashley came back to Taiwan recently for the semiconductor industry research and now since we're talking about it I just wanted to ask you what's your um, opinion on TSMC's Arizona investment <laughs> This is a very tricky question. <laughs> but well, we're, uh, we're saying that China yeah. might be surpassing U.S. economy by 2035. Mm. Um, but Biden administration seems to be very optimistic about the Arizona investment. Sure. So do you think it's going to convince the U.S. to better really position um, to lead the world economy continuously? Well, to be honest, actually, the TSMC is not just one company. It's mm -hmm. an ecosystem. It's right. uh, numerous uh, satellite companies innovatively supporting TSMC and generations of generations of Taiwan's skilled, high skilled uh, engineers to work there. So a lot of people actually are worried about T uh, TSMC investing in the Arizona or uh, in Japan. But after I spoke with many of experts in the field, mm -hmm. I think actually the headquarter TSMC in Taiwan is not really replaceable. Mm -hmm. in many ways because right. again what I mentioned is the ecosystem Americans realize that they really do need to have a safety blanket what if Taiwan happened anything they could have a, a small safety blanket mm -hmm. but to have the, the scale to production and the most advanced uh, production I think it really does take time for American not only not not mention that China actually has a lot of money right government and the numerous people the population but the reason why China still won't be able to produce this quality advanced products in my current observation is again come back to that highly controlled social system mm -hmm. actually prevents any high skilled innovation social and system. the quality of the production it's really non-exist in China. This is as far as I can see. So it does, innovation needs money, needs human talents. China has a lot of money and human talents, but they can't really you know, circumvent that. And therefore, the China made, made in China 2025 is just a pipe talk. Mm -hmm. It's interesting how you mentioned quality and innovation. Um, Ambassador, I wanted to ask you, in terms, there's also a counter argument that TSMC building the Arizona plant is actually good for Taiwan in terms of integrating with the U.S.-led supply chain. As Annie mentioned, this is a huge, massive investment in Arizona. How do you see that? Do you feel that this is actually good for Taiwan in integrating with the democratic world? Well, uh, this is a, very, uh, is a very complicated question because I saw so <clears throat> happened. I, I was uh, in, the, in, the, in the forum yesterday mm. talking about the TSA, TSMC. So it's a semiconductor form. Semiconductor form. And uh, I was surrounded by some other, you know, uh, IT mm -hmm. experts and IT businessmen. Uh, that's a kind of a controversial, okay, maybe a debatable issue. Why we should, you know, send the uh, TSMC for another, you know, investment, mm -hmm. a huge amount of investment in Arizona. Mm -hmm. Of course, 
that in response to the U.S. invitation, we have to work with the United States at the current time. For whatever reason, we have to work with them. So since they have, they have the urge and they have invited Taiwan to, uh, to share their concern, we have no reason to say no, okay, in given the certain, you know, uh, given the current circumstances. So TSMC has going, and I also had a dinner uh, just uh, two days ago with the TSMC, uh, you know, senior executive, mm -hmm. former, not, a, not an incumbent, senior uh, former executive. He told me that privately, it's a, it might not be a good news for Taiwan because, it, uh, you know, it, depending, depending on how we're going to conduct the forthcoming, the from some of the follow-up, mm -hmm. the subsequent mm -hmm. behavior. Because now, now that no matter how controversial it was, how debatable it has been, now it has become a reality. Mm -hmm. Now we should take this advantage of this opportunity to further consolidate the U.S. administration to how to make our ties even closer, mm -hmm. not only serving the U.S. interests, but also serving the Taiwan's interests as well. Mm -hmm. So it might, it might be uh, debatable, but if it's a good news, this uh, TSMC guy told me that, it certainly is a good news for TSMC. Right. It kind of spread the investment, yeah. okay? I think they are, they're going to set up another, uh, you know, factory in, in Germany or in Japan. Mm -hmm. I don't know if the U.K. has a TSMC, no. not, not, not yet. No. So this is a, after all, this is a good thing. but. From my diplomatic experience, that sometimes the, uh, this kind of diplomatic or international investment, in, it's, not, it's hardly a zero sum game. 100% mm -hmm. good and nothing bad. Nothing bad right. It's a kind of a pro pros and cons. Yeah, well, so I, I think it takes, it takes a work of art, it takes a work of wisdom, and not, not a philosophy to, to get this done in a, very smoothly and very effectively as possible. So, so at the end of the day, it could actually lead to more investment, more ties with the U.S., strengthening of that relationship. I think, you know, honestly, I think <clears throat> that would be up to our government's uh, responsibility mm -hmm. to, uh, <clears throat> to form a task force, okay. form a team about this TCMC project to be the, the beginner, but it's the first case, but it's not going to be the last case. So how could we try to take better advantage of this opportunity? Because now that I think fair to say that U.S. should be indebted to Taiwan. Mm -hmm. They owe us something. Mm -hmm. Now we should take this into case. Now, to speaking of the, the basic, basic work in the diplomatic diplom diplomacy, that give and take. Right, now right. we give you something, now what can we take in return from the U.S.? Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's, it, it's up to our bilateral talks. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm sure that as a, as a veteran diplomat, always say it takes a communication. Mm -hmm. Always a communication, communication, communication. And, and I feel like, view. yeah. Right, and I think Ambassador really made a great point. Um, throughout these communication, we're actually going down back to soft power again, right? Mm -hmm. So, but again, at the same time, like what you said, there's always pros and cons when it comes to investment and negotiations. Um, of course, you know, like this is just a relationship between Taiwan and the U.S. But in terms of the counterparty China, we're also facing pressure day by day. Yeah. As a diplomatic perspective, um, how do you think Taiwanese people should adapt to this? Well, still, given my, uh, my life and work in Africa, for example, mm -hmm. I set up a medical mission, as mentioned earlier. And I also promote the function of our agricultural and vocational uh, you know, mission there. Mm -hmm. So that has drawn some... Uh, admiration, if not jealousy, from the Chinese embassy, mm. embassies mm -hmm. in certain part of Africa. Okay. They even they like to see because in Af in in Swatini, Swatini, there are quite a few mainland Chinese expatriates right, right. living in Swatini. Right. So they are they are the size of the uh, the mainland Chinese expatriates uh, ten times that those of Taiwanese. So I know a lot of you know many Chinese people living there. So they need some medical service, and they need some med you know agricultural mm -hmm. food. Mm -hmm. They ask me for help. Mm -hmm. I said to give a you know, broad-minded person. Mm -hmm. I told them that you know, don't bother to contact your ambassador in South Africa or Mozambique. I'm your ambassador. I'll take care of you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I say, I'm. So I made myself very popular to all the, all the people there. I became a household name in, uh, in Eswatini, and that's not what I expected. But I simply do something out of my passion, mm -hmm. out of my sincerity, to help the people, not limited to, to, to Chinese, Hong Kongese, Taiwanese, mm -hmm. or even Indo-Chinese, you know, in the, in, in the China Peninsula, but also the other people. 
the, uh, the African people, even some of Japanese. Right, they, right. they asked me for help mm -hmm. through the Japanese embassy. Mm -hmm. I became a very, so later on, that's one of the reasons I was elected by the American ambassador to be the dean of a diplomatic corps. Right, so diplomatic allies and also diplomatic friends from around the countries yeah. are actually very important. So we're actually utilizing soft power every day. I would like to give a few minutes back to our professor. I feel like sometimes professors over overseas, you're also serving as like a diplomat, right? So when you communicate with other professors academically and also with students, do you also put yourself as a role of a diplomat on behalf of Taiwan? I think as an academic, my role is neutral, but mm -hmm. as well as what Ambassador just mentioned, uh, provide medical um, care for the um, Chinese, Taiwanese, Japanese students. I provide knowledge education mm -hmm. to the Chinese students, Japanese students, South Asia students, and of course, Taiwanese students. Mm -hmm. So in many ways, I think um, the discussion with the students and make them to understand what is happening in the world, is especially to the mainland Chinese students, is what we are doing as a academics. Um, I speak for the democracy, mm -hmm. of course, then speak for Taiwan. But I don't want students to fall into the rivalry China-Taiwan because I don't the mindset, think, right. exactly, I don't really think that's helpful. Mm -hmm. I want them to see that why Taiwan strive for our own international space, mm -hmm. what is the value of democracy, what is actually happening in the world apart from what they've been educated throughout from their you know, educational system. Mm -hmm. This is challenging, very challenging right. in many, many ways, especially they, the number of the mainland Chinese students in the UK has been really a lot. Mm -hmm. And um, to stand up there to say Taiwan as a professor, to say Taiwan is not part of China, you do need to tell them the reason why. You do need to convince them. But I think by doing so, we are actually speak out what we would like to them That's to know. very courageous. So have you seen substantial change when you've done that? And has their perspective and how they see Taiwan change? It's and very difficult for them to really admit to me, say, what you said is correct. Mm -hmm. Because we need to consider they need to return <coughs> to the country. They are self-censored. But I do have students, and, and they are very much aware there might be years in the world. You know, it's really the, the censorship in China spreading out to even overseas classrooms that's possible. You just never know. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but I do have students come to my office and to tell me that, uh, Professor, I, I understand what you're saying, but I do face these conflicts that when I went back home the system are totally different. different. But I know there's a different world outside mm -hmm. there. Yeah. Right. And I think that really echoes back to what Ambassador talked about earlier. The social system in China probably is a setback for why um, we also believe that semiconductor may still be one of the vital role in Taiwan, from its economic power to how it's empowering countries around the world to advance their own development. Now, coming up next, we will hear from Taiwan Boer Ai Wen Chu, the first Asian American female New York State Senator elect, on sh how she plans to be an ambassador for Taiwan. Welcome back to the show. Let's now hear from Ai Wen Chu, the first Asian American female <coughs> New York State Senator elect. Chu was born and raised in Taiwan, moving to the U.S. to pursue her graduate studies. She spoke to me about how she plans to raise Taiwan's visibility as Taiwan's ambassador in promoting trade and other ties between Taiwan, New York, and the U.S. Let's take a look. I have to say that's extremely proud um, and surprised because when I announced uh, to run for this election, um, I did not, it did not occur to me or I did not realize I am actually running to be the first Asian woman uh, in a state senate. Um, I did a li little research, uh, Google it, um, it's started from 1777, 245 years. We did not have an Asian uh, for, uh, woman in state center. That's how we underrepresented as an AAPI community and also as a woman um, female platform in politics. So I'm just proud and honored to have this opportunity to actually represent women and represent our Asian AAPI community from uh, New York to so our next generation, they can drink big. They can they can see Asian American is um, as equal and have the same platform, have the same opportunity. 
What changes have you seen in the U.S. midterm election? Have you felt U.S. voters become more inclusive and willing to give immigrants a chance? In the U.S., in every 10 years, we we're doing census, right? The, the counting population and the diversity, how we allocate the resource. And that's what we found out um, in southern Brooklyn here, where my district, it's uh, the population grow is a 40 percent Asian, more Asian population uh grow. And that's how, um, based on the federal law, constitution uh, amendment, so we, we could actually have this uh, Asian majority district form so the Asian community and immigrant community, Southern Brooklyn, they can have a collective uh, election power to elect someone who understand um, their needs and who can actually represent them in, in political um, stage. And that's why uh, I'm not saying it's allow immigrants to have more performance or more platform. It's more like uh, it, in New York, the whole diverse are very immigrant friendly and society in general do recognize um, immigrants as equal, as a strong, and we have our own voice and we can represent ourselves. So um, that's why I announced to run and that's how people elected me to because not because I just speak their language. I'm also one of them. I, I came from the community. I am an immigrant myself, right? The Taiwanese American, I born and raised in Taiwan. So I'm not, you know, coming here when I was a very younger age. I, I speak the immigrant story, how you work hard, how you achieve your American dream, how you go after what you believe and how you prove to your next generation. If you work hard, you could actually you know, you can be whoever you want to be. Um, your story is very inspiring. And um, you talked about um, how immigrants have been empowered. And and um, there has been a lot of um, talk about the economy, inflation. And, you know, it could be seen as some sort of a retaliation or, or referendum on the ruling party, which is the Democratic Party. Um, Economic issues seem to not be the only key topic that the voters have decided on in this election. Do you see that? 100%, in, especially in my district in New York, in New York City and in Brooklyn, uh, economy is a topic, but the most uh, hot topic is actually public safety. It's about because um, like Asian community perspective, because the COVID in the past two, three years, the anti-Asian hate crime uh, got uh, spiked high rocket high number. And I we our AAPI community do have very uh, serious concern on daily life, right? Can the kids go to the playground? Can the student take the subway to go to the school? Can a senior go to um, supermarket to go grocery shopping without worry about being pushed off the subway or on the sidewalk. When you're walking on the street, you, you worry about those attacks out of nowhere simply because you look different, right? So say public safety is a, a major issue uh, this year. And like, I have to say the worldwide, maybe we all facing the same thing because COVID, the society never been shut down for a period of time. So now we try to bounce back for economy. We try to bounce back for on the inflation. Yes, those things are the side effect and people are just going to attack on the sitting party, which is like in America, that's a Democrat. In Taiwan, that's probably right. The DPP, it all has those, the sitting party need to deal with those aftermath, the side effect. No matter you did, a, you did a good, you did a bad, people just need to criticize you. And if they're not happy about um, about your your policy or they want to see more improvement, all of those are falls to the responsibility of the sitting party. You talked about um, being born in Taiwan and being also raised in the country. How do you feel um, you can advance ties between Taiwan and the state of New York? I being um, a proud uh, uh, Taiwanese American. I'm a proud Taiwanese American. So during my campaign, I actually 
I'm happy to be, you know, the image or ambassador uh, political side to introduce Taiwan. I'm the face of Taiwan because um, not many people know about Taiwan, but I, when I introduce, I came from Taiwan, born and raised, I came here age of 27, they'll be like, what, 27? I say, yeah, but let me tell you something about Taiwan, right? Taiwan is the you know, the first uh, country in Asia who legalized same-sex marriage, who have universal health care, who elect their first uh, female president, all those platform United States and New York tried to push for years. We, we try so hard. And guess what? There's a place in, in Asia, they have it all years ago, years ago. So that's how people know about Taiwan and are happy to be the one who can expand Taiwan's uh, visibility in the political uh, spectrum and stage. But again, building a strong relationship um, with other country in terms for economy uh, development or um, anything can mutual benefit both sides. That's something we definitely open up, looking forward to it. Speaking of Taiwan, do you plan to come back anytime soon? To... My parents, uh, my, my mom, my in-laws, my family, they're all in Taiwan. My friends, they're all in Taiwan. As I say, I came here at age of 27. So all my right adulthood life, uh, the first half, they're actually in Taiwan. I have colleagues, uh, friends uh, who I used to work for in Taiwan. So I do hope I have the opportunity to go visit Taiwan very soon. But uh, right now my schedule is kind of like busy. So I don't know when will be the next time I can go back, but I do look forward to go back. So I need to see my mom. You just heard Ai Wen Chu, Taiwan-born New York State Senator-elect, spoke to Rav about how she will help promote Taiwan economic and cultural bilateral ties with her state and the U.S. Let's now discuss why such diplomacy matters and how it plays a large part in making real policy a reality. So, Ambassador, I, I think today uh, was very interesting, whether it's from the ambassador or the professor, whether we are diplomatic um, representative or as a professor, um, we all play a very vital role in presenting Taiwan to over, um, overseas countries. But you've been a senior diplomat in both the United States and also Canada. Can you also share the importance of how local ambassadors or private sectors in that specific local country can really help advance Taiwan's representation and interests? In, indeed, I think the US and Canada, they happen to be the most ideal place for, for, you know, for witnessing a lot of you know, CBC, you know, Taiwan Board and ABC. Okay, they are the second generation or some mm -hmm. third generation from Taiwanese immigrants. Mm -hmm. And I happen to a lot of them. When I was in Washington DC and Ottawa, when I set up the, the, the Taiwanese you know, de facto embassy mm -hmm. in, in Canada, I was very uh, happy and honored to get to know some, some very good friends there. Even now, we still keep in touch. Mm. Well, take one uh, lady, for example, uh, who's a senior now, uh, is a, was born and raised in Taiwan. Until the age of seven, she moved to the U United States. Elaine Chao, mm. Zhao Xiaolan, okay, no. used to be the secretary of uh, uh, yeah. labor and also a secretary of the uh, of transportation. So he, she was born in Taiwan, and then the, she speaks some Mandarin Chinese because in you know, a family education, very focusing on the Chinese language training. So that's how I asked my son to learn from Elaine. And Elaine, sometimes she, she, she called me her brother because we spell the same last name, C-H-A-O. But you know, right. in, in, in the US, they're following the mainland Chinese spelling, Z-H-A-O. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But Elaine spelled C-H-A-O. I said, well, we, we, uh, we, are the, we belong to the same family. Now, yeah, you're my brother. So ever since we become friends, yes, seriously, indeed, this kind of uh, uh, Taiwanese expatriates, immigrants in Canada, in USA, they did help mm -hmm. our relations yeah. with American or Canadian political circle community a lot. For example, I would like to uh, mention that this morning I, I, I called my, my friend in Washington, D.C. He was one of the examples. Mm -hmm. He was a very successful lawyer, okay, living in Washington for mo more than 30 or 40 years. Mm -hmm. And he has been donating, making donations to some you know, American uh, public office holders. Right. And he's a Democrat. Mm -hmm. So now he has been uh, you know, helping some new senators Elect, senators elect in Georgia, you know, the last count, Georgia, right. 
That, that's, that, that, no, that minister was his uh, friend. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Also, he helped some other uh, American senators. When I was there many years ago, when I was in charge of congressional liaison, and this lawyer, he helped me you know, liaise, okay, converse with certain senators, federal senators, not a state senator. So I went through, I think he's one of the very good examples. And other than now the current, the new generation, Elaine Chao is from the, uh, the last century, but now Catherine Dai, mm -hmm. you know, the U US you know, trade representative, mm -hmm. USTR. Catherine Dai, her, her parents from Taida, National University. And Catherine Dai, I, 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 don't, I don't know her, but my friend knows her very well. Mm -hmm. Catherine Dai is another example, not a successful example. Success, success story of the Taiwanese immigrants, you know, the, uh, the, the children, they did help us. But right. we, we shouldn't take them for granted. Mm -hmm. I think we should consolidate. So I, uh, during my time there, during my, in my tenure there, not only personally, but professionally, I helped them a lot. So I think that's kind of a very, uh, very good you know, uh, circle. And then the, I, I, uh, I, I really appreciate their help. Mm -hmm. Senator, certain senators, because of his friendship, for, for my lawyer's friendship, I encountered certain problems, difficulties. Mm -hmm. Those senators helped me. For it's example, intriguing how this works and how our diaspora, the Taiwanese diaspora, mm -hmm. yeah. is influencing local politics and raising Taiwan's profile. How how does these individuals work with the mission, the Taiwanese mission, in these countries? Well, there's a certain fine line we have to work on very carefully. Mm -hmm. Do you make decisions like say, okay, you will go out on this mission, and then you'll have these local ambassadors go out on <clears throat> particular missions, given our um, special diplomatic situation with Well, you, ha you have to keep in mind, there's a certain fine line. I was saying that because they are not Taiwanese mm. citizens. They are American citizens. But that could be an advantage because they can That's speak. That's right. That, they can speak both languages. Right. And they, they know both, you know, both sides of people. Mm -hmm. And But this is a certain, you know, American law, American rule. You have to abide by the American law without going over the board. Over that, the board that might right. become very, uh, not only uh, controversial, mm -hmm. but even more seriously illegal. Mm -hmm. to get involved in the U.S. domestic parties. So, so I, we uh, and uh, th those friends of mine, they and I, we keep very, very uh, balanced mm -hmm. and very, uh, you know, uh, very uh, legally mm -hmm. uh, allow a certain area to work with uh, those American politicians. And we uh, work very, very, very well, very right. smoothly. Ambassador, you're saying in areas where Taiwan is, say, prevented from, from the diplomatic situation, these people come in handy and they can help speak on Taiwan's behalf. That's right. Mm -hmm. Let alone, let alone that some of you are, you know, I was, uh, I, I was covering the U.S. Congressional, you know, so I know some lot of senators.